Welcome to this evening's event. And before we get started, I would like to uh, thank our sponsors, our platinum sponsor, Sutherland, our gold sponsors, Silicon Valley Bank, Alston & Bird, TechDraw, Our Capita, Miller & Martin, Carlton Fields, Saferth Shaw, McKesson, and Morris Manning & Martin. Without their sponsorship, we would not be able to bring these events to you. I'd also like to thank our host, Georgia Tech Research Institute, for making their facilities available to us this evening. My name is Virginia Persons, and I am the chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum Atlanta chapter. And it's a great honor and pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. And with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Ann Ravel Petcher, without whom this program would not be possible tonight. Thank you. Oops. Good evening. Thank you all so much for being here and welcome to what's bound to be a very exciting, uh, energizing evening. Um, we're going to have a group of innovators and leaders here. Oh, you know, I just want to say, those of you who are associated with Digitainment or TAG or Southeast Venture Conference, Thank you so much for coming. These were our promotional sponsors, and we didn't get a chance to mention them. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to have a stage full of innovators and leaders tonight. And these guys really understand the whole progression of the digital entertainment space, where it's been and where it's going. So um, in a minute, you're going to learn a little bit more about our panelists, Braxton Jarrett and John Hashimoto. But I'm going to start right now with Jim Lauterbach. This should, I shouldn't need a sheet of paper here because I've known Jim almost 20 years. Um, and he's one of the most fun and ex inspiring technologists and media experts that you can ever get to know. So take full advantage while you've got him here in the room. Jim's a web TV pioneer. He was at the beginning of ZDTV. He was at the beginning of Tech TV. He was obviously at the beginning of Revision 3. He's an editorial thought leader. Jim um, ran PC Week Labs. Jim was the editor-in-chief of Windows Sources. Jim was the editor-in-chief of Ziff Davis Internet Properties. Jim was the senior vice president and editor-in-chief of PC Magazine. Shall I go on? <laughs> He's led us all for a long time and really helped shape where the industry went because of the kinds of coverage he uh, facilitated for us. He's a fabulous speaker, which you're all about to learn. Um, but he also brought a lot of fun to CES, for example, really started the whole CES uh, best of show uh, events. And no one will ever forget his Comdex uh, tchotchke report, I'm sure. Anybody who remembers Comdex. Uh, <laughs> it was a while ago. Now he's uh, spearheading an internet TV channel uh, with a fan base that I have, I've never experienced anything like this before. He had a tweet up last night. The people who came to this tweet up, because Jim said, hey, let's talk about Revision 3, come down, I'll buy you a beer. The people who showed up know so much about this internet channel. You would, the passion, the excitement, it's not just that they knew the on-screen personalities, they knew the cameramen. They knew the producers of all the shows. They've been tracking this since day one and so committed and passionate. So I'm going to give the stage over to Jim and let him share some of that passion with you now. Thank you. So thank you guys. It's great to, uh, to be here. I'm based in San Francisco. So if I turn this on and walk around, let's see if that works. Can you hear me? This is a great place anyway. I could probably just speak loud. Whoops, there goes all these. Um, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about how I got here. Uh, so Ann talked a little bit about it, but I was... You know, I'm a geek. I was a programmer. I was building applications um, back in the days. Anybody remember something called client server? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I was at the forefront of client server. And, to, uh, and, and so I was building apps, but I started writing about it because it was brand new. And so I, I, I wrote a, a methodology for client server. And, uh, and, and surprise, surprise, it ended up on the front of a magazine called DBMS. Anybody remember DBMS? Um, so. So, and out of that, I was like, well, this is great. You know, maybe someday I'll actually be able to write for a living. And um, I answered an ad in the New York Times for a job lab director at PC Week. And it was great. I, I thought they were just going to let me, you know, I'd meet them and they would make me a writer. And they hired me. So that's how I kind of ended up in media. And it was totally, I, I didn't think it would happen, but it did. 
And it was great. And here I was in, in, in my 20s. I had a column in a major magazine. I was speaking to all the geeks. And it was so cool. And I was so lucky. Basically, I was lucky. Got the job. And then this thing called the internet happened. You guys all remember when the internet happened in the early, it was like, yeah. It, 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 and 1995, there was Engadget and Gizmodo and bloggers. I mean, maybe not that early, but in five years, the magazine industry had changed dramatically to the point where now where every single magazine I worked for either has a different name or went out of business. And it's not because they were bad. It's just because the business model changed. And so what happened? So we started in 1992 and 93, putting our reviews up online. And you know, it was great. You know, I, I remember this guy, one of the guys in my lab came to me and said, can I, can I put our reviews on this thing called the internet? I'm like, yeah, sure, as long as you get your work done, you're welcome to. And um, we were first before Wired. Don't let Wired say they were first. We were first at PC Week. But I then would sit in these meetings with the publisher, and the publishers would be like, how can you put our stories online? We get $40,000 for a half-page ad, and, and, and we get five cents for a banner. Um, but we did it. And over time, the business models changed. And so now we have blogs, we have social networks, we have Tumblr, we have Twitter. And it started out just a magazine online, but it, then it became all these things. And so then I started this cable net, and I was part of this cable network called ZDTV, which became Tech TV, um, and ended up being bought by Comcast and rolled into G4. And that was really interesting because we also did something interesting there. We, we didn't put celebrities on. What we did is we put real geeks on TV. And not every geek is good on TV. Actually, very few of them are good on TV. But some of them are. And we started broadcasting. And actually, we went up on satellite. When we launched, we were in two places. We were in Las Vegas. And uh, we were on those big dishes in the backyard with the cows in the front yard. And what we, it was amazing. We went up, and we would go, and we had these amazing fans. And people would come up to us, and they would be like, Oh my God, I can't believe it. I live in a town of 500 people. I thought there was nobody in the world like me. But when I turned on CDTV, all of a sudden I realized I wasn't the only geek in the world. And just because there was no one in that town like them, they discovered this community of people that were like them. We changed their lives. Then about uh, five years ago, six years ago, seven, um, Paul Allen bought ZDTV, turned into Tech TV. Paul Allen's the world's worst investor um, he, because he believes everyone is like him. How many people are billionaires? I know, unfortunately, we're not all like Paul. So Paul loved us for a while, and then he didn't. Um, so he sold it. Uh, network shut down. But there were still all these people that felt there was a community there that they wanted to be a part of, and it was gone. So what happened is a couple of guys had been working for him. He started this thing called Revision 3. And they started making shows, and this is when the uh, video iPod came out. And the internet was now actually really able to do real video. And they started creating these shows, and having this community came back. So there's a show called Dignation, which is basically two guys sitting on a couch drinking beer, um, talking about the stories of the, of the week. And it started building up a really big audience. So after about a year of that, they raised some money, and they came to me, and they said, we're building a real business. You want to jump on board? You want to come over here and be part of this? And help us run the company and be CEO. And I was like, heck yeah. I was at PC Magazine, which was in the process of going away, basically. Uh, and uh, we hadn't found a buyer. And it was a long story. But, so I went over to Revision 3. And you know, three and a half, almost four years later, we've got 25 shows. We do 50 million videos viewed a month. We've got 15 million people who watch it, focused on guys 13 to 34. And I'm going to show you a little bit of what it looks like talk a little bit about some of the um, lessons that I've learned. And then um, I'm going to uh, bring up some of these other guys, and we're going to have some fun here. Uh, this is Revision 3. This is who we are and what we do. Today's to cover some of the hottest news and stories on the social news site, com. That's D-A-W-G.com. Team trades up on Craigslist. From phone to porch. Bro, it is not that easy. Mr. Jimmy Fallon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Totally Rad Show. It's magical. This game may be the best single player game I've ever played. <laughs> Scam School, the only show dedicated to social engineering at the bar and on the street. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Doing Street Fighter button mashing. 
Welcome to Film Riot, the show that takes the mystery out of the effects and techniques that go into some of your favorite Hollywood films. This is the beginning of a new era. What I'm actually doing is giving you guys control of my life for a year. So we're gonna do it. They, they told you to leave Nebraska where you're from. Right. Yeah, and right. now you live in San Francisco. That is correct. I am on my way to volunteer. That's the first continuous task you guys decided you wanted me to do. Welcome to Scientific Tuesdays, everyone's favorite source for chemical mayhem. Today we're gonna construct an instant smoke bomb. If you pour yeast into peroxide, you get this effect right here. Coming up on Destructoid, Bulletstorm teaches you silly ways to murder people, Capcom pulls a Zynga, and we desperately, desperately want you to call us. I am a big fan of the first game. What are your thoughts tonight? I was playing it last night. You saw me. I'm scared of it. I'm a huge yes. wiener, okay? Welcome to App Judgment, your source for mobile app reviews from Revision 3, the long-awaited official Twitter app for the iPhone. Today in App Judgment, Skype on a droid. Hey, welcome to ByteJacker, the best source for downloadable and independent games in the universe. The man himself, Mr. Tony Hawk. Do you play yourself when you play Tony Hawk branded games? <laughs> I, let's just say I play as my character. Augmented reality news, a white PS3 and PayPal hates conferences. I'm Callie Lewis, welcome to Geek Beat TV. Uh, this pen point starting now. You can be as against Obama as you want, but this is just it's just not true. He's not a member of the Taliban. It's just stupid to even say that. Lock the door, dim the lights, and set Firefox to private browsing. Because it's time for another unboxing porn. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. This is your weekly dose of techno lust. We're talking about all sorts of cool stuff. The proverbial device you buy once and has internet for life. That just makes it's me It's wonderful! Giddy. Free internet! Yes! Hi, welcome to AD Talk. You're joining us for the second part of our top 10 films of 2010. Number 10 was True Grit by the Coen Brothers. At number 9, A Prophet. 8, Carlos. This week we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite train wreck, Jersey Shore. Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, kings of the fighting genre. All right, the combatants are set. Let's end this debate once and for all. Fight! Right as we speak, uh, there's been heavy gunfire reported in Tyrus Square. Rush Limbaugh, who says he wants the president to fail. They're politicians. By their nature, they're cowards. Welcome to Tom's Top 5, where each time we meet, we count down another hot list. I'm Tom Merritt. Number one, say it with me, it's the iPhone 4. So th there's a quick overview of what we do, but the point is, is that as we create this online, thank you for clapping. <laughs> As we do this online, you know, we're not trying to recreate television online. What I found is what, on the magazine side, when we started putting our articles up, it wasn't a magazine online, it's something different. Internet video is a new medium. It's different in what we're trying to do, and I think we've done a pretty good job, is figure out what that thing is. And so it's uh, authentic hosts, real people, communities around them, uh, and really building that community around the topics that they're interested in. So it's gaming and technology and things like that. So, you know, I want to talk just for a couple of minutes about some of the lessons that I've learned in the last four years, because I was an editor-in-chief of a magazine, and I kind of got, you know, drop-kicked into being CEO of a startup. And uh, one of the things that, by the way, one of the things I learned is, is that when you talk, make sure you number your index cards so that when you drop them, you can put them back in order again. Um, but <laughs> the thing that, that it, it's really interesting, and, how many of you run companies? How many of your CEOs? So you guys know this. There's no owner's manual. There's no book. There's no course. I got an MBA at NYU. None of those courses was, here's how to be a CEO. So uh, you know, I got in there, and the learning curve was amazing. And it was it, it, it's fascinating. So the first time, I went to my first board meeting. Like a board. Nobody teaches you how to deal with a board. I went to my first board meeting, and uh, I hadn't even started yet. And, and my boy, I've got some really good investors from a company. Uh, and um, you know, one of them, David Z, is investing in Facebook and you know, just putting money into Pandora. And these guys just did Groupon. And um, you know, I sit there, and, and uh, as we're going through the numbers, they had just given us $8 million. And the guys at the company, there were about 10 of them, had just spent about a $1 million on a studio. They neglected to tell the investors that they were doing this. And so we're going there, and, and so, so the, David sits there, and he's like, 
where'd all the money go? You've only got six and a half million. You, we gave you eight. And they're like, oh, and so he starts going to this ramp. It's like, how oh, could you not tell us this? And so the first thing I learned is no surprises. Don't surprise your board at a board meeting with something that you've done. Make sure you talk to them about it. Um, the other thing I learned is that board members are irrational. Um, and that, uh, you know, even though I hadn't started yet, they were all over my case. So I'm like, wow, what have I gotten myself into here? Second thing I learned is like a team, you got to build a good team to complement your skills. And this is something that, um, that I didn't really know either. I mean, I've been good building out teams of people who were good. But when you run a company, there are a lot of things that you need to know that I didn't even know I didn't know that I needed to know, but I didn't know. So one of them, I was talking with uh, some folks today about this, is you know, I had no idea how important a good finance person was. I was like, I was a math major. Numbers aren't that hard. I was given a guy who was an accountant. He was handling everything. I thought it was fine. Till uh, again, another board meeting where one of my board members said, this is all screwed up. Fire that guy immediately. He doesn't know what cash flow is. I'm like, okay, I guess I'm firing him. Um, ended up bringing in a contract CFO for a little while, which worked out really well, but ended up hiring someone who is now my VP of finance and operations who really knows like finance is more than numbers. Surprise. And really is my partner in building the business now. She's amazing. And so the second thing I learned is get yourself a really good finance partner, somebody who can handle operations, but also really know what you're good at and what you're not good at. Hire people to compliment you, which I did end up doing. Luckily, I hired a head of sales because I would never had really done sales. I hired a head of sales who's built a great sales team who has been just amazing, and that's the reason why we're in business today. But finance, really, really important. And then when you hire a really good team, listen to them. This was a hard lesson to learn. And I'm a smart guy. I was there because I'm a smart guy. I knew what was going on. Uh, and we'd sit in these meetings. I'd be like, oh, I don't do that. And I was like, wait a minute. Is, how many of you guys are football fans, right? How many of you guys are you Atlanta Falcons, right? We're in the shadow of the Falcons. So, yeah, so you got Matt Ryan, right? Matt Ryan is great. He's a great quarterback. Who's your backup? Chris Redmond. Now, the game plan in football is basically to turn Matt Ryan into Chris Redmond by taking the passing away and just having him hand the ball off. Because anybody can hand the ball off. Well, that's what I was doing to my Matt Ryans. I turned them all into Chris Redmond. I wasn't really listening to him. You know, I was like, but so, so I realized, it's like, hey, let them do what they do well and go out there and do that. So, you know, if you're gonna hire or draft a really good quarterback, let them throw the ball. Um, so another thing I found out is you can have too much money. So in 2007, and we, we actually, this was not a, this was a little problem for us. It's a big problem for other companies I've seen. But we, from two, mid-2007 to mid-2008, we, you know, we were flush with cash. We were trying to launch shows. We were going out and buy, paying people this and paying people that. And you know, we had some success, but not a lot. And then, everybody remembers the fall of 2008, right? What happened? The world fell apart. Um, we were told to... You know, that, that, that it was going to be the nuclear winter and that uh, we were probably going to go out of business. So we cut $2 million uh, out of our budget. We went through, I mean, I laid off a third of the staff. We cut all the shows that weren't working. But in fact, it was the best thing that ever happened to us because we really focused on our business model and how to make money versus how to just spend money. And that was important. And so, you know, it, it's important not to overraise, and I think you can see companies in the video space that have done it. You guys know uh, Bright Cove, for example. Really good company, but I think they raised too much money. I don't know how they're going to get a return. Look at, you guys know Ustream? Another company that raised, I mean, like, so much, their valuation is so high. All they do is stream illegal content on the internet. Well, they do more than that, but they're never going to get that back. Um, but the other thing I would say is too little sucks, too. So don't raise too little, don't raise too much have financing options. The other thing we did is, uh, we during flush times, we lined up venture debt, where we had a uh, million and a half or two million of venture debt from Silicon Valley Bank. There's someone from Silicon Valley Bank here today. Um, you know what? It was painful, but we drew it down and it saved the company. You know, and then for the next three years, I had to pay it off, which really, really was hard. There were things I wanted to do with that money, but I didn't because I had to pay Silicon Valley Bank, but it saved the company. So it's a really important thing to have those options as well. Um, you know, revenue. Uh, I was told when I started, 
by the, uh, it, you remember these in the early days of the internet, right? Don't worry about customers. Don't worry about revenue. Build your business. Get users. Get, you know, unique visitors. Blow it up. Blah, blah, blah. When I was like, you know what? I've seen this story before somewhere. Pets.com. Um, and uh, so, so I actually hired a sales force and started selling. And then in the late 2008, you know, the, the investors will do this. They'll pivot on a dime. They'll be like, I never told you not to worry about revenue. Revenue is going to be really important for you. You mean you don't have a sales force? Luckily, we had one, and we were bringing in revenue. So revenue is, a, is very important. Um, strategic planning, too. How many, and I'm sure this is a good group. You guys, how many know uh, what a BHAG is? Right? How about, you know, SWOT analysis? Anybody ever do a mission to Mars? You know, these are really, really important concepts from a young company at an early age put in a strategic planning process where we said, here's what we want to be in 20 years. Here's what we want to do in five years. Here's what we want to do this year. Here's what we want to do this quarter. Because if you don't have a roadmap, you don't know how to get there. And it's really, really important to do it. And it, it's hard. We try and sit down once a year for a day. We sit down quarterly for a half a day. There's so much going on, but you've got to do it. And you've got to plan, you've got to update, then you've got to communicate. And I uh, recommend this uh, book called The Rockefeller Rules. I'm not sure if you guys know it. Um, but write it down if you haven't. It's a great book. It's like this thin. But it's a great book for building a strategic planning process. I really, really like that. The thing I think is important is be an expert in everything. And this is something I learned as well. Is you don't do everything, but be ready for it. Because, like, for example, I come from the content background. I'm really good at content and programming. But I have a great guy running programming. So I don't get all up in his grill. But when things fall apart or someone leaves, I need to know how to go out and do it because a small company, until I hire somebody, I've got to do it. Right now, I am responsible for our video encoding infrastructure. I've got people who are encoding video right now that I talk to every day to make sure we get our videos up. Now, that's not going to last forever because I'm hiring somebody to do it, but I've got to know how to do it so that I can make people come in there. So, so you know, if not you, who? But know when to stay out of people's grill and get into people's grill. Um, Hiring, uh, yeah, so there's a company out there in Silicon Valley, um, everywhere now, household name. Their hiring practices are, and I know this is MIT, and I'm going to diss on MIT a little bit, but their hiring practices are only hire people from the top schools with high GPAs. And that's a problem for them because, you know, there's a range of people. A lot of those people are really good, but you know what? A lot of the people who come from top schools are really smart but not great at what you need them to do. So this company has a lot of really smart people, and they have a lot of idiot savants who don't know what they're doing. They end up going out to the divisions that aren't doing very well and screwing them over. I'm not going to get into that in any more detail. But what I will say is that hiring to me is, it's, you know, education is important, but it's really drive, passion, and experience that really make it happen. And um, so 50% of the people you hire are mistakes anyway. So learn how to fire quickly, which I still don't do very well. Uh, I don't think anybody's really that good at it. On the investor side, you know, I've got one big investor, um, the guys from Greylock, who are great. But I didn't know this. I didn't know that you're better off having two or three investors. Because if you just have one and you want to raise more money, they're like, eh, I don't know, whatever. If you've got two or three, you can play them against each other. They can both come in. They kind of want to one-up each other. You have different voices at the table. So we ended up, you know, after end of 2008, I couldn't raise more money because nobody was giving money to anybody. Um, we did actually end up raising a little bit more. Um, but the important thing also is as you raise more money, leave room for angel investors. Because just because you need people to write big checks doesn't mean that they're important people that you want to bring in who are going to write small checks that can help you out as well. So, for example, in our last round, brought in Mark Cuban. Now, he didn't write, a, not for a lot of money at all. But just having Mark Cuban available to talk about stuff and to run stuff by. And we disagree with stuff all the time. But it's great having him at the table. And that's because I left room to bring in smaller angel investors, even in later rounds. They can really, really help you out. It's really helped us out as well. And the other thing that, the last thing I really learned about startups is startups are, I mean, startups are bipolar. They're either like agony or ecstasy, right? It's either like the most amazing thing in the world, we just landed this plan, everything's great, let's go drink champagne too. Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. We're dead. So the other thing I think that, you know, the most important lesson I learned in a startup is don't be bipolar to run a startup because it's just going to make it worse. 
And if you can be level-headed, and if you can keep, it's like that Rudyard Kipping thing, if you can keep your heads when everybody else around you is losing them, you're going to be much more successful. And luckily, personally, I tend to be pretty even keeled. I don't get too high or too low. And I think that's really important. And then the last thing is just, you know, have fun. Because you're doing it. Have a good time at it. And um, one of the things I talked about, there's no manual and no, you know, nobody writes about this stuff. There actually have been a couple of guys who are actually writing about it now that I've learned a lot about. So if you, uh, you know, they're much smarter at this than I am. So I'm going to give you four names of people who have blogs that I encourage you all to read if you're interested in this. The first is Fred Wilson from Union Square Partners. Uh, he has a blog called AVC, and he does this thing called MBA Mondays, where he goes through all this stuff in way more detail than I have, just about financing and hiring, and he's brilliant. Um, Mark Andreessen wrote a blog for about a year that was full of really good information that's still up there. He doesn't update it anymore, but it's all really good. Um, ben Horowitz, his partner at Andreessen Horowitz, now is writing a great blog about a lot of these issues. And then finally, uh, Mark Suster does a blog called Both Sides of the Table. All of those are really, really good resources for this. And um, you know, starting a business is a blast. Running a startup is a blast. But it's also, it's, it can be a real pain, but it's a lot of fun. So um, hopefully, if you're doing it, we can commiserate and have a drink. If you're not doing it but want to do it, go for it. Um, just make sure and get your Prozac. Um, so with that, I want to bring up the next speaker on our lovely panel. Um, and I'm going to get his stuff going here. Um, John Hashimoto uh, is just he's an amazingly funny and witty guy. Uh, and he's over at uh, Weather Channel. Uh, runs the Director of Interactive and On-Demand Television Product Integration and Management. His bio's in there. Surprisingly, he does not tweet. So maybe we can ask him why he doesn't tweet um, when he comes up here. But uh, anyway, he's a 20-year veteran of the media producer at CBS, CS, CNN, and Time. And uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about what he's up to. So come on up, John. Thanks, and I'm going to sit right here and gaze adoringly at him. I encourage much, you to Jim. do the same. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I started off in, in the media business back when there were only three channels. So that's how, how old I am and how much things have changed. I don't know how I've kept up with it all. I don't know why I'm, I'm still working in it. Um, but I'm hopeful that by the time uh, I'm all said and done, uh, cable will actually have interactive television. I think that will be a huge milestone. <laughs> Talk a, lo a lot about the Weather Channel. I'm very fortunate to be at a company that has gone through a lot of transitions over the past 25 years. And it's, it's no longer your father's Weather Channel anymore, as I, I'm sure many of you know who have smartphones. And I sh I'm sure all of you have smartphones. We are. Uh, we believe we are the cross-platform leader in the media business today, uh, that more people consume the Weather Channel content across more platforms every day than any other media property out there. Uh, let's start with the cable network. Uh, it reaches more than 100 million subscribers across the U.S. For the past uh, decade or more, probably closer to 15 years now, we've been a, a superpower among uh, among many on the web and with our desktop application we're generating something like 35 million uniquely views uh, a week a month rather on that platform uh, on the mobile platform we're uh, the number one downloaded smart app on Android and Google uh, excuse me Android and Apple and then on iPad tablet we were one of the first news organizations that released an iPad application and uh, we're the number one downloaded news and information app. So our, what stitches all that together is providing people whether where they want it, uh, whether they're at home, obviously that's TV and the web for the most part, increasingly the tablet. On the go, when you're driving to work, we actually syndicate a radio service around the country as, as well as have mobile. Uh, and then at work, increasingly people consuming the Weather Channel on their apps and on their PC. And then when you're traveling, we obviously um, are an important, almost indispensable service for folks who are about to travel, whether they're going to see family or, or, or go off and, and golf and swim at the beach. I work on interactive television, the Weather Channel, something that uh, the Weather Channel's been involved in for probably about a decade now, uh, starting back in the old days with applications for Wink and Web TV and things like that. Uh, and, and really doing a lot of R&D, right? I mean, it's been mostly trials. Uh, back in the day, it was mostly trials. Um, a couple hundred people may have seen on an application somewhere. Fifty of them were people in our, in our own building. 
Those days are, are gone, thankfully. I got uh, to the Weather Channel about three years ago. They had just released an application on DISH Network. DISH has a fairly robust interactive TV platform where there's 10, 15, 20 apps from programmers and from other content providers as well. Um, so we've had an app on DISH for about three years now. It's uh, the most popular application. And this is not surprising. You know, people need and want weather information and even on a television have trained themselves to use a remote to call up a very simple application. Our application on, on DISH is bound to the channel is what we call it. In other words, you're watching the Weather Channel, that's how you access it. And, and since then we've released an application, a bound application or on-channel application for DirecTV as well. Off-channel is kind of the new breed interactive TV uh, and these are the widgets on television, smart TV, which we'll talk a lot about I'm sure this evening. But uh, DISH, or rather, uh, DirecTV has a, a widget platform. They call it TV Apps. That's about a year old. Uh, we know that other uh, major or traditional providers of pay TV are doing the same thing, looking at widgets on TVs. Uh, obviously, looking over their shoulder at Samsung, LG, Google TV, and saying this is something that consumers want. They want to be able to continue to watch ESPN but call up a quick weather forecast. Uh, or watching the Weather Channel, quick call up a quick sports score. Another form of interactive TV that's actually been around for a little while, uh, Comcast and others have these, are TV portals, you know, Channel 100, Dish Home, where you can get a couple of apps, the, the you know, the lottery stuff, or you can get horoscope, and invariably weather as well. And then increasingly, uh, what we've seen in the past couple months, and we're actually working on an application for the two-screen experience, the iPad. What I'm showing here is um, an image of our, our new app that's going to go out here in about three or four weeks in iTunes. It's uh, what's called the Nielsen Media Sync app. Uh, this is for a brand new show that we're uh, premiering in late March called uh, From the Edge with Peter Lick. And you may have heard about the Grey's Anatomy app here in the last couple of weeks. This is a, another version of the Grey's Anatomy app for one of our programs. This This platform was... Uh, has been developed and is supported by Nielsen Media. And what you're doing is using Nielsen Media, the, the same encoding machines or new generation of encoding machines they have that put the audio marks inside our broadcast so that they can get ratings information. They're using a version of that to embed these triggers in the audio of a show. And your iPad can listen to those triggers. Hopefully your dog doesn't hear them and start barking. Uh, but your iPad can hear those triggers while you're watching Grey's Anatomy, the live show, or the new show from the Edge on the Weather Channel. And we're creating these what we call synced or paired interactive features. So while you're watching, you have your iPad on your lap, these features will pop up and they're interactive and they're contextual to what you're watching in that particular moment on the show. An interactive map while Peter Lick, our photographer, is climbing around a volcano in Hawaii, let's say, uh, or photos that he's taking. You get to see close-ups of those on your iPad app. You'll get to read trivia about Peter or the locations he's in. You'll get to take a poll, a quiz. You can hook into Facebook and Twitter and interact with other fans of the show. So that's kind of the new breed, one of many I think we'll see, of these two screen experiences. Nielsen's plan is to release this. Obviously this has been released on the iPad platform. They plan to release it to the Android platform and you'll be able to use it on your Android and uh, iPhone as well. We also are involved in video on demand and TV everywhere at the Weather Channel, like most cable networks. We've been doing video on demand for probably six to, six to eight years now. Um, we do a, a form of video on demand for Time Warner called Quick Clips. You're watching uh, the Weather Channel, and if you want to uh, hook into or call up a VOD uh, asset of your forecast or more localized information, you can do that on about seven or eight Time Warner systems across the country. This is a this is a kind of an exclusive Time Warner service that they've been trying to trying to spread across the country in their systems for years now and and uh, they're hopeful they can get it beyond those seven markets here in the next next year. TV everywhere we will talk a bit about this evening I'm sure uh, we've been involved in a couple trials of with our on-demand content as well as a live linear feed for MSOs, including DISH and Charter. Uh, we're having conversations with uh, dozens of others about this. And uh, as we all know, those folks who read about the CES this past uh, January, this is all moving to mobile, right? It's all moving to tablets. Uh, and 
Uh, there were even some announcements, I think, today about Cablevision and others putting their entire cable network lineup live and on demand on iPads in the home. So uh, the big picture for this new type, new breed of television, this interactive television and VOD and TV everywhere and interactive advertising, advanced advertising, this is the Bank of America Merrill Lynch point of view on that and how things will look from now until about 2015. Total ITV enabled subs here in the U.S. will climb uh, to more than, you know, nearly 80 million subscribers. Um, addressable TV advertising will track closely with that. Uh, TVs with widget app platforms. Virtually every major TV brand uh, has connected TVs. In fact, you can't avoid buying those. They're just built in nowadays. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know if you're going to refresh your TV set anytime soon, but when you do, you'll, you'll end up with a connected TV that will have Pandora on it, Netflix, Revision 3, probably a Clearleap app, and Weather Channel app as well. Um, Households with over-the-top video services, this is the Rukus and the Boxies of the world, also expected to climb. The big question is the last graph here, line graph, and that's how many consumers are going to actually buy a Google TV and disconnect from Comcast Charter Dish. The evidence at this point is not that many people, but I suspect Jim may have an interesting point of view on that uh, as we talk about how many consumers really think it would be a better experience, certainly a more economical one, to cancel their, their cable subscription and simply live off a streaming box of some sort, or for that matter, I think a lot of people are predicting within a year, a branded Apple TV that has built into that Apple TV everything you get on your iPad and, you know, your iPhone. So I think that's, that's what we're waiting to see, and, and I frankly expect to see it happen soon. Thanks. Thank you very much. I actually have one question for you that ties into Reactive that I just have always wanted to know. Um, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but um, you know on Google when I search for weather, how come Weather Underground comes up before the Weather Channel? I love the Weather Channel. I don't <laughs> like Weather Underground, but it always comes up first. They have a very um, tight relationship, interestingly enough, with, with Weather Underground. One that uh, we have recently, I kind of think, changed their opinion about. They, as you can imagine, Google always approaches things from a uh, algorithmic point of view, and they conducted their own research about <laughs> who actually gives the most accurate forecast. Really? And early on, their determination was weather underground. After we visited them you know, about a year ago, we changed their mind. We were able to show them data which proved that our proprietary forecast system, which we call TruePoint, is actually more accurate than Weather Underground. So you'll see some changes to those, those results. But as you know, Jim, it takes a while for the Google yeah. results to kind of switch over and trend differently. Well, they think they're smarter than everybody else. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, I like the Weather Channel better, so I'm glad you're doing that because I'm and, tired of seeing it come up first. And by the way, Jim, they do think they're smarter than we are about weather as well. It's quite amazing. <laughs> Okay, we're going to bring up somebody who is actually smarter than all of us, Braxton Jarrett. Actually, uh, Braxton uh, from Clearly uh, is actually, we're partners of theirs, so I've known Braxton. Actually, interestingly enough, when I was at PC Mag, I worked with his wife too, so I've known Braxton and his wife for a long time. Uh, co founder, CEO of Clearly, an IP based voice on demand services company. Pretty and also, he's uh, led, the he was led the expansion of Tanberg in North America and launched the first broadband internet content service. And um, I'm going to. What do I need to turn over here? Do I need to turn over anything for you? Braxton, come next on up. Next one, next one. Okay, I'll do it. Next one. It's, uh, it, there is voice, by the way, on our video platform, but we are a video platform. This one. It says voice and video. Voice on demand. Look at that. Voice on demand. It's got to be. It's video on demand now. Because we don't do voice, we just do video. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Braxton, take it away. All right, thank you, everybody. Let's see. So our, our company was started about three years ago with the basic assumption that the, um, the living room was still the untapped frontier for digital media and IP delivered video. You know, we, we obviously saw the YouTube phenomenon happen and lots and lots of choice on your PC, but you know, in many cases you're sitting there in your living room looking at a giant HD screen on your little laptop with an inferior internet connection 
watching something because you know it's the thing you really want to watch. The reality is most people want to see it in the big screen, the biggest screen available, and in most cases that's the living room. So, so we felt there was a huge opportunity to bring a lot of the technology, functionality, choice, and the things people loved about internet video into the living room on the TV, and that's the the basis of the founding of our company a few years ago. So fortunately, we uh, we guessed right, and the, the the things are really starting to happen uh, that, that we were hoping would happen. Today, as a consumer, you have more choice than ever on the TV. After lots of fits and starts with various startups over the years, it's now clear that internet on your TV is happening. It's, it's mainstream already by most measures. And as John said earlier, you know, pretty much any TV, by the end of 2011, almost any TV, Blu-ray player, uh, game console, anything that could hook up to a TV or, or could be called a TV is going to have internet connectivity built in, probably Wi-Fi, and it's going to have the ability to play back internet video from a number of different sources, and it's going to have a widget platform or an app platform, much like you see on tablets and phones and everything else. So here's a few uh, screenshots of what, what you can get today. There's Apple TV up there. Uh, they've, they've had a second version, and there's rumors of an, an actual TV. Right now it's a little $99 box that you can plug in and play your iTunes library. You can also stream Netflix movies and other things. Google TV, uh, by most measures, has been considered a flop so far, despite their brilliance, self-proclaimed <laughs> brilliance. Anybody from Google in here? <laughs> All right, kid. <laughs> I should have asked. They that. wouldn't be the ones that have the uh, GPA requirement, would they? No comment. Um, They're not on this card. <laughs> Anyway, so Google TV is a, initially a box, and then it's also built into a couple TVs. It allows you to do uh, search and navigation across lots of different video and TV content. Uh, and then across the bottom are just examples of a couple services or apps or widgets that you can get on these devices. So Netflix, um, you see on your left, is by far the game changer in this category. I'll talk a little bit about them in a minute. But they've really brought this mainstream the idea of streaming high quality movies, TV shows to you know, almost any device, um, any, D any TV, console, uh, and so forth. Vudu is a pay movie service, and Hulu Plus, you've probably heard of Hulu on the PC, is, is a system that's owned by the major networks, and they, they've, they've had a, a product that you can get on the PC for free, and then you can pay a subscription price for that and get some premium content, and for them, as importantly, you can get that widget on your TV on a number of different devices. So really huge you know, innovation and opportunity in this space for the consumer. So Netflix is by far the most interesting one here. Um, you know, they started streaming on the PC probably three-ish years ago, uh, and then very quietly initially started to do some widgets on TVs, and in particular there's a box called Roku, which we'll be showing in a minute which is a really inexpensive box that, that you can hook up to any TV and your internet connection and get the full uh, or pretty complete Netflix library streamed instantly. There was a lot of skepticism when this came out that you know, the video quality wasn't good, it was going to be too complicated, people don't want to plug another thing into their TV and switch remotes, and uh, the fact is every one of those claims has proven to be wrong uh, just by the, the pure numbers. Netflix now has over 20 million subscribers. Almost all their growth they attribute to the streaming tier. They have a, a $7.99 a month tier that allows you to stream their full streamable library. And I think you get one DVD still with that. But, but people are buying it for the DVDs. We're a good example. We, we have that plan. And I think we've had the same DVD in our house for probably a year. <laughs> I may have way. lost it. Um, <laughs> not sure how that works. How many people have Netflix? Anybody who doesn't have Netflix, go sign up at netflix.com slash Dignation, and you'll get two weeks free. Lisa, are you in here? <laughs> she doesn't have cable TV or Netflix, by the way. <laughs> you need Netflix. Um, so now there's over 100,000 titles. It's available on 240 different devices. It's basically built into everything that you will you know, ever get. <laughs> and in fact, they announced some deals at CES where they're getting a branded button on remote controls. So even if you're in your cable experience uh, you know, through a set-top box, you just put, push the Netflix button on your remote, it overrides everything, and up pops the Netflix uh, application. So huge, huge success with this application. Um, we did a little research internally to show, you know, is this a flash in the pan or is it a, you know, a, a real phenomenon? And what we tracked was a couple different, essentially new concepts of TV services that are being launched. And we, we compared it against DirecTV's launch, Direct uh, Dish's launches, launch, AT&T's launch, and then HBO, which is more of a, you know, rather than a service, a content 
offering. And in all cases, the adoption rate for Netflix to get to the first 5 million TV users, this isn't internet, this is the pure TV users, was 5 million new users within one year of launch of the service. So it's phenomenal and it blows away you know, all these other metrics. So it, it's a true phenomenon, it's here to stay, and it really is changing the perception that, that consumers have about how you get and consume TV. Uh, all right, next question. Any cable operators in here? Cox, I'm guessing. Okay. Hey, guys. Um, thank you for your business, by the way. So this may seem a little insulting, the next stuff that comes along here, but um, I just wanted to compare that kind of the current versus the current state of the art. And this is, this is really a Comcast user interface. I know you guys are doing some very advanced things with your new boxes. But, you know, the, the reality is the, the current experience when a consumer looks at a Netflix experience on a connected device versus a cable system is, is pretty vast. The bills are high. You know, the perception is there's a lot of channels you don't watch that you're not viewing. Uh, but you're still having to pay for. The user interface still doesn't have any search capability on video on demand. Um, you're, you're doing sort of text search and text browse throughout the system. Um, and what's happened is it's, it, the cable subscriptions in the U.S. have started to peak. Some of this is from um, a, you know, satellite launch and Verizon and other IPTV services, but there's no doubt that, that there's also an impact on some subscribers changing their types of service. And, and probably the, the, the research that's most interesting is new consumers coming out of college that have never had a cable subscription are not signing up as rapidly as historically have. And so this, this new generation of people coming out of school is trained to use you know, the PC and other devices, and that's, that's, that's kind of changing the industry here. But cable is, you know, far from dead. I think cable has done an incredible job at building up the programming offering on there that many of it's exclusive, it's, it's comprehensive, there's a huge amount of sports programming that you're only going to be able to get through a multi-channel subscription. HBO and Showtime, you simply can't watch that without a subscription from a, a cable operator or or a satellite operator. And as importantly, the actual pipe into the home that cable has is far superior than almost anything out there. The only thing better than a cable pipe is pure fiber all the way into, into the consumer's home, and only Verizon has invested in that, and there's not, we're not likely to see that happen uh, with any other telco. So that, that's a giant pipe. Some of these operators are now looking at launching 200 megabits per second service into the, into the home, which is extraordinary if, you, if you're familiar with those, those bandwidths. I mean, that's a thousand times, ten thousand times more than you could get even two or three years ago for the same price. So there's, there's a lot that the operators have to offer. So what we as a company focus on is blending the two, the two benefits of these kinds of systems. Big pipes, lots of bandwidth, unique programming relationships with the IP delivered content and the consumer experience that people are already doing and uh, you know, are moving to no matter, no matter what anybody does. So we provide uh, a widget platform essentially that allows cable, telco, satellite oper uh, operators to, to be in these devices to have ubiquity across all the different devices that the consumer is going to have and then offer branded content services that are all integrated into one experience. So you're not going to have to choose between Netflix and you know Roku and your cable system and have all these different interfaces. Instead you're going to get a really integrated consumer experience and all that programming from anywhere you want really. That's, I think that's the beauty for the consumer is you're still going to get the premium programming that you can only get with a multi-channel subscriber subscription but then you can also get you know anything else that you might be interested in that, that's not going to come through those, those traditional channels. And that's already being done in the market. So Comcast and Time Warner are the most public ones that have announced this at CES just a few weeks ago. There were Samsung TVs that had Netflix and Hulu and Revision 3 and a number of other uh, channels up on the, the, the App Store. And right next to it was a Comcast Xfinity logo and, and uh, you know, the full functionality that you, you would expect from a TV widget. Time Warner was doing the same thing. They are, they are announcing and, and have shown a full channel, linear channel lineup on all those devices. And then the big news was that uh, Cablevision is doing the same thing. So you get full video on demand, full linear television interactivity all built into one uh, CE-centric device essentially. So that's a little bit about ClearLeap. I, I actually set up a Roku box here. Um, anybody have a Roku? Anybody know what that is? A few of us. Um, 60 bucks. Yes. You can get into it for 60 bucks. It puts a whole world on your television. 
So for $60, it's a single box, has HDMI out component, essentially any output you would want, has built-in Wi-Fi, built-in hardwired Ethernet, comes with a remote control, which I have here. Uh, the new boxes that they're putting out start at $60, actually going to do a price decrease, so it's going to be sort of between $40 and $100 for, for the boxes. It's about this big. Um, you can put it in your pocket. I brought it here. I just hooked it up to the open internet connection in this uh, booth and then just did video out into the projector. And with that, I have essentially the full programming that you can get from cable, satellite, and, and the internet all in one device. So let me see if I can turn it on. Plus the box itself is free. Uh, all the services are free, except Netflix you pay for, Hulu Plus you pay for directly to them. There is a, uh, a cable net called Wealth TV that's streaming on it. Um, we were talking about this earlier. It's the only place in the U.S. that I know where you can watch Al Jazeera. That's right. Which actually was pretty cool over the last couple of weeks. Okay, so you, uh, when you buy a box, you set up different channels and, and uh, widgets, essentially. They call them channel store, but it's, it's like an app store. So most boxes come with Netflix on it. Um, I won't show you that. It looks just like the Netflix streaming interface that you'll see on the PC. Uh, and then you can add channels in their channel store. Um, I'm about 50 feet away, so let me see if I can. Somebody in the way? The camera's in the way. There we go. Hmm. All right, so you, uh, you click on the channel store, and inside this channel store, you'll, you'll see a number of different uh, options for channels that you can download. Um, and you know they have a bunch of different ones. These are the common ones. Cableco is our generic cable operator application. This gets branded by the local uh, cable system once once they've done a deal with us. And you can do Facebook photo feeds, Pandora. A number of the major sports networks have their own channels on here, so you can get a mix of live games, out of market games, a um, number of other uh, sources of sports content. Here's Revision Three right here. So Revision Three has built uh, their own set of content on this and so when you go in here you see all the different shows that you saw on the reel and those are available instantly to view on this device. And then once you've added them it's simply a matter of authenticating that you're a subscriber of those particular channels. Um, in the cable version if you're a subscriber to a system that has this application then you just uh, you either enter a code that you're given um, when you log into the system online or you can call your operator and our system generates a four-digit unique code that you tell them, and then it's authenticated. Once you go in here, um, you get the full lineup of content that the operator wants to offer. Um, so, and, and you get because it's an internet-delivered service, you can do all the things you'd expect to do. So, you have search. We have what's called predictive search, where you start typing, and it automatically starts filling in the things that you could be watching. I know I saw Avatar uh, preview recently, so I want to go over here and watch Avatar. And now I'm going to click on the title and again this is just over an open straight internet connection I'm just gonna hit play and it starts to uh, buffer HD in this case this I believe is 720p So you get the idea. So now um, for that, that was a preview because we, we don't have the license to show it to you, or at least I'd have to pay a lot for it. Um, but if you're a subscriber and this is linked to your billing system, that would automatically just be billed to your cable bill. You can also put a credit card in if you like. And now that's, um, you know, that kind of capability is available across all, all the programming that you, you, uh, you, you would get in, in a cable subscription. So movies, network shows, premium content brands like HBO, Showtime, and others, and then all sorts of different things, including music, video, kids programming, and so forth. Um, and then, you know, I showed you already here, Revision 3, you have, you have this full capability to add as much or as little as you want. The Roku newscasters, where they have a number of live channels that are fed into the system, um, and, and the one that Jim was mentioning earlier, he, he mentioned this, I didn't know this was available, so before this started, in about one minute, I came here, downloaded this app, and started playing it, and now this is a live stream coming from the English feed of Al Jazeera. So you could come and see kind of what, what the latest is going on in the Middle East in just a matter of seconds here. Let's see, I should start up now.
I guess it's got a long way to go. But what this <laughs> does is uh, it buffers enough so that you know you can start have an un uninterrupted stream. So it depends on where the stream's coming from. Um, but generally, it takes you know a matter of five to ten seconds to get started, and then you have a, a high quality stream coming in. So I think you get the idea. Um, so that's that's the end of my part of the conversation. Come on, have a seat, and we'll uh, talk a little bit about it. Thank you very much, right. both of you guys. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a little bit of a conversation about some of these issues. But I encourage you guys to participate as well. So um, if you have questions, there are mics. I think we're going to have a couple of people walking around with mics. Um, I want to start off, but this is you know this is your time. So you guys get up there and ask questions, because your questions are going to be more relevant to you than the ones that I've put together. Because these are relevant to me, and I think they're relevant for you. I want to start off with cord cutting, because both you guys talked about cord cutting. Um, and uh, you know, uh, John, you, you, you seem to think, according to your research, that it's not a big deal. It's not going to be a big deal. Braxton, your research seems to show that it might be a big deal. Um, my sense is that it's maybe more cord shaving, where we'll see people cutting back on what they pay for uh, and augmenting it with, uh, with internet video. I mean, we look at it as where, you know, an average consumer watches five and a half hours of video a day. Uh, we don't want to replace it all. We just want to replace the worst hour, um, you know, when they're watching wrestling or something. Um, but what do you guys, let's talk about it. Real or not? People cutting or not? I'm not seeing the cutting. We are seeing the shaving. Some of our customers, they monitor the data traffic and where it's coming from. And what they've seen is as much as 40% of all the traffic on their high-speed data pipes are coming from Netflix. Mm -hmm. That didn't exist a year ago. And at the same time, people are starting to cancel HBO and some of the premium services. And so I think that's what's starting to happen is people are thinking of Netflix more as an alternative to HBO or movie channel or you know, that premium digital package than, um, you know, than a true, true replacement service. And that's, you know, I've heard that term cord shaving, and that, that, that I think is much more common. I think the big fear of the industry, though, is not the cord cutting, but as I was saying, it's, the, it's people never getting a cord at all. Right. I mean, if, if you've grown up stealing you know, pirated movies and music in your college and you know, viewing everything on a PC, that's how you want to view it. And it's going to be really hard for people to kind of go back to a, a model that you know, that, that, that uh, involves a subscription and forces you to get all the channels that you may not be interested in on, on a, you know, kind of... No, John, what do you think? Well, I, I, we look at the example of TiVo, uh, which was a disruptor, certainly, but then you take a look at the uh, number of subscribers to TiVo, which has kind of gone down a lot, right? I mean, and why? Because they've been co-opted by, in some cases, because of their own co cooperation, of, of course, but co-opted by the cable companies. Um, these guys aren't going to go down without a, a big fight. Uh, and they're already working in their labs, I think. And you guys are probably involved in some of this. They're already working in their labs to provide some of the functionality, improved UI, and really what it comes down to is the choice that consumers want. So I, I think we think it's going to take a long time before there's that paradigm shift that people are talking about. I, that's what we're all talking about. And, and in the meantime, I think the industry, the classic providers, I'm not sure they're going to you know, catch up rapidly, but we think they're going to alter their, their service offering. Well, so do you think we're going to get to a point where, you know, on the Roku, you can go and select the channels you want and put them on there. Some you pay for. Some are free. Um, when you sign up for cable, you sign up for bundles. 100 channels, 200 channels. You know, you guys are probably like me. How many people subscribe to multi-channel service? For pretty much everybody. How many people watch more than 15 channels on a regular basis? So, you know, do we get to the... And does. And, of course. Um, <laughs> do we get to the point where consumers are able to, you know, whether it's delivered via IP or via cable and who gets a cut of it, we're going to be able to select the channels you want um, and not pay for the others. John, what do you... you know, that's, a, that's a big disruptor for your business, right? It certainly is. And it's, it's why we're, I think, why we're so aggressive in... Uh, in providing whether, as I said, where you want it. I mean, it, it doesn't scare us at all. I think we're, we've already proven that the weather channel, the brand, the service, and our ability to be, you know, flexible uh, is really what is our secret sauce, right? So uh, in the apps world, uh, as I mentioned, you know, people are turning to the weather channel brand. Um, 
they're turning to our service. It's, it's, the mo it's the app they're looking for. That well, I noticed the bad weather guys up here, but not the good weather guys. Right. You guys aren't on Roku yet. Yeah, I think our focus, quite frankly, Jim, is where the audience really is. I mean, uh, how many people actually own? There's a million of these yeah. now. Yeah. There's a million. Right. There will be, they claim two million before the end of the year. But we're looking at numbers, you know, that are um, 20, 30 million, 50 million, you know, uh, smartphone uh, owners, uh, a huge leap in the number of people going to own tablets here in the next year. That's where our focus is. It really is where the audience is. Braxton, what do you think about uh, uh, a la carte versus bundles? Where do you see that? world evolving. Well, I mean, and there's huge, huge uh, resistance from both cable and programmers for the bundles. You, you know the business. It's, um, it, it's frankly, everybody in the world who is not interested in ESPN is subsidizing those people who are. Um, I'm, I'm one of the few that would not like an ESPN subscription. Um, and, you know, I pay for it because if you, if you look at how much they charge, every single multi-channel subscriber in the, in the country, period, has ESPN if they have anything other than the absolute basic tier, and ESPN gets you know anywhere from five to fifteen dollars a month for that. And the problem that everybody says is you know at a la carte is if you bought a la carte it'd be fifty dollars. So yeah, you can have your a la carte ESPN and a few other channels, but it's going to cost you the same amount of money. But I, I still I, I would almost you know for me it would be a win, and I do think. What's going to happen is there's going to be a couple of these providers that start getting flexible with their, with their bundles, and that's going to open it up and, and give consumers more choice. So a question over here. Earl Jonaber, Tech High School. And, uh, I'm going to go get a Roku right now. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that. Uh, I'm just really curious with, with all this uh, video is, uh, I've got three questions here, and they might sound unrelated, but they uh, hopefully t tie it all together because it relates to um, you, you're really in uh, competition with uh, us educators because uh, kids are glued to this stuff and uh, it's more interesting than books and um, so forth. And that's probably old news to you, but what, what, how do you handle and shop for the cost of bandwidth and uh, what what technologies are you looking forward to um, to either you know compressing content or delivering it um, more inexpensively? That ties in because the kids um, use game interfaces, and I didn't we didn't talk about game interfaces tonight. But uh, you know I'm really an old man when it comes to game interfaces. I go, what are they doing? You know, and I try to get involved in it. It's pretty difficult for me, but. Um, so I guess that there, there, there seems to be a, is there a openings for more, for you guys working in, in uh, interactive education? I know inside our educational institutions right now, the bandwidth tends to slow down. And, um, but it's pretty fast on the iPhones. Yeah, so I, I mean, just to, to pick some of these off, you know, first of all, Everybody in your neighborhood starts watching Netflix and HD at the same time over a Roku. What happens to the bandwidth? Is that an issue? Is it an issue, cable guys? Yeah. What I'm seeing, though, is the, the race for more consumer bandwidth to the home is, is, is uh, well underway. I mean, this, this 200 megabit service that some people are starting to experiment with, I mean, one HD stream compressed here is about three to four megabits a second. So, you know, just a one 200 megabit pipe, you could do, you know, what is that? A hundred, yeah. yep. uh, 50 to a hundred streams. So it's, it's hard to imagine, I think, in, in that scenario that it gets, it gets too, too difficult. And, um, every, you know, everybody's in a bandwidth war where, where there's competition. So I, I, but, I but, think, you know, you should get a cable modem and, and probably go but for there, that. But there isn't a lot. Of, I mean, we're, we had there, you know, at most people have two providers that are competing, so. Um, although, you know, I want fiber to the curb as well, but Verizon stopped building it out. Yeah. Right? Um, what about game interfaces? Uh, are you, uh, you guys over the Weather Channel building Weatherville? <laughs> Weatherville. <laughs> Angry weather, actually. Angry weather. Good. <laughs> It'll be released uh, in a few weeks. <laughs> uh, Jim Cantori's idea, probably. Um, no, we, we, we actually uh, are on a PlayStation. Uh, you know, they've built uh, that interface with the globe and stuff, mm -hmm. so they've integrated uh, 
I'm not sure with our permission, by the way, but they've integrated <laughs> the, the weather data on that globe interface. Mm -hmm. And we absolutely feel like um, there's great value in that, um, you know, in 3D presentation, uh, geolocation, obviously, for weather. Virtually any of these technology advances have a weather application, we think. Um, I, 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 we're not going to be building a social game anytime soon, I don't <laughs> think. But, but I expect that, you know, weather's an immersive experience by nature. And, and so the further we can stretch into that and, and make it an immersive presentation, uh, the better for, for us. I mean, you look at these interfaces and everything we showed off, it's pretty much, it's pretty linear. It's pretty up, down, right, left. And, uh, you know, 3D game interfaces are pretty interesting and advanced. I, I, I'm not so sure that they really make sense in finding video, but who knows? I'm going to look for a game because I know... There are games on here. Yeah, right? and they're doing a big push to do games. That, like you said, though, it's, it's different from an iPad where you have a really interesting, you know, touch screen and you have... Um, really powerful processor. The, this, this box, the reason why it's $60 is because it, pretty much all it does is displays jacket art, has a, you know, text uh, in it, and, and then allows you to play video. So you're not going to get, you have to actually point it back. Yeah, up. I know, I, well, I think the, the camera is in there. You, you're the, you have the ideal place to do it. There you go, yeah. four in a row. Classic game. Yeah. So what you're going to see, I think, on the TV is a lot, a, that, uh, probably a casual game explosion similar to what we've seen elsewhere. You're yeah. going to see a lot of simple, fun, uh, easy kind of games you can play with the family. But that, that's absolutely coming fast. My question to you guys, what are people doing on Roku? Isn't 80% isn't of it streaming movies and people don't even pay attention to them? A lot of it is Netflix. Look, I okay. mean, right. it is a Netflix box, but also right. now it's got Hulu Plus. Right. People are starting to play around with that. And there are other channels on it. I mean, we have... You know, we've driven a lot of Roku boxes for our fans. Uh, we actually recently, the original Apple TV had a really bad chip in it that only did 24 frames a second in HD, and we, we discontinued using it, but we did a giveaway where we gave away five Rokus and we gave people discounts. And a lot of people, you know, are using Roku for that, but it, it is a Netflix box. I mean, I don't know what you're yeah. seeing. No, I mean, it started, they actually were originally either owned or financed by Netflix. Right. So it literally was a Netflix box for the first year or more. Um, and, and so that's the majority of what people are using. The other one that's probably the, the second most popular app here is Pandora. Yep, um, right. you know, Pandora yeah, is kind of a game changer on music. Mm -hmm. And then the other interesting thing we're starting to see is that on video on demand, music videos are actually one of the most popular things that are, that are seen in terms of plays. And so we think the combination of putting you know, music videos and a Pandora-like experience on this box is, is going to be pretty extraordinary too. So we're, we're enabling that. Well, as far as a disruption, I think these you know, streaming, internet streaming to the TV, these boxes, they've already killed Blockbuster around the corner. Mm -hmm, right? Right. To me, that's the first thing that right. got killed was, and now, you know, even the red box is getting, getting hurt, right? Although People they're starting a streaming service as well, That's right. right. Too late, uh, too late. You know, the, the Roku, interesting, just one, one trivial fact. Uh, everyone talks about TiVo, but remember, when TiVo came out, there was a competitor called Replay TV. You remember Replay? Um, the guy who started Replay, Anthony Wood, started Roku. So... There you go. There's a little history. And Ro I mean, Roku is, there are a million. Um, they just, they told me they're selling, and this is definitely not public, but um, this is private forum. So uh, around <laughs> oh, 2,000 2, uh, boxes a day now. Yeah. And that's growing, that rate of growth. So it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, I mean, it's not mainstream, but he pointed out recently, Anthony Woods, that he is now at a million subscribers, the, as large as the 12th largest cable operator in the U.S., and you know, doubling and tripling. If you have three or four million subscribers, you're cable vision. You That's know, true. And you're approaching yeah. Charter and Cox. So it's, it's a pretty meaningful number. Our strategy is to work with dozens of boxes and devices. And so what we offer our customers is, hey, one, one application gets you on Samsung TVs, Blu-ray players, which are actually the biggest number because when you add PlayStation 3s plus all the internet-connected Blu-ray players, that is the single biggest number um, of devices out there that are already connected to the TV. It's not like you have to go convince somebody to do it. It's done. Yeah, but what how many of those Blu-rays are actually hooked up to the Internet? Uh, I, I, it's, it's in the millions. Yeah. Um, how many people have a Blu-ray player with Internet connectivity? Okay, keep your hands up if you have it connected to the Internet. Okay. Self-selecting crowd, but we have another question over here. Would you like any more data? No, that's enough data. Point. I'm sorry. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I told my wife I was coming to disruptive media thing tonight, she thought I was on my iPad again uh, with the Xfinity app and changing her channels from here, so, yeah. um, <laughs> which is a lot of fun to do. 
Uh, but you know, we talk about 3D, and it's had a huge disruption at the uh, at the box office. And that, what do you see? I mean, is there going to be a Roku 3D box coming out? And where do you see the future of 3D and how it affects uh, the media that we're getting? You know, I, I think uh, one of the things that Netflix proved is when, when they first started streaming, everybody said um, the video quality is too too poor. People don't, aren't going to really care about it. And and what I think. Um, YouTube probably started proving, and then certainly Netflix solidified was the fact that people will pick choice and convenience over you know perfection on the on the picture quality, and that's been the philosophy for a lot of these guys, including Roku. So what they do have a 1080i um, or 1080p and i output on on their newest boxes. So I I wouldn't be surprised if they start supporting 3D, but I don't think that's the driver. I think. Um, I think it's really going to be more about all this choice and flexibility and you know, ease of use and different kinds of applications. And, and do you think there's going to end up being, I mean, one of the things I noticed is PowerPoint up here a lot tonight. Do you think there'll be a disruptive media piece to you know, get rid of PowerPoint eventually? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's you called know, video. It's just very expensive and time consuming. Well, I'll tell you about 3D, and I, I'm really interested to hear John's point of view on this as well. But I think 3D in the home is a little bit of a problem because you have to wear glasses right now. And you know, you're going to lose the glasses. They're expensive. I can't even find my remote. And I don't want to put on glasses to watch TV. And a lot of times when I'm watching TV, I'm doing something else. Think about the two-screen experience you're talking about. You've got the iPad there. You've got, you're reading. You're, you're on the computer. And it's hard to have the glasses. So, so I don't <laughs> see that until we get to the point where you can do 3D without glasses. And um, I don't know where you guys are much closer to it. You're probably, where is my 3D weather channel? Yeah, we've heard that a few times, and it's a compelling idea, you know, if you didn't have to wear the glasses, exactly. And it didn't cost us so much to actually produce 3D. <laughs> it's an expensive proposition, to say the least. With, and, and, you know, we analyze everything from a return standpoint. Um, and so that's why we're waiting and seeing, although we might see some of our new primetime programming in 3D as early as late this year. Oh, really interesting. Yeah, a couple episodes kind of approach. Inside the tornado from the Weather Channel. <laughs> in 3D. Do we have a question over here? I have a question. Uh, when do you see this evolve into a two-way interactive video, something like uh, Facebook Live or uh, you know, Family Skype or whatever? So, uh, I'm not sure. Can you repeat the question? Or what, like, so when, when do you see this whole thing evolve into two-way interactive video? Like FaceTime on TV. Like oh, okay. Facebook Live for where you can actually see each other. Well, you know, Skype and uh, Skype is an app. I mean, a lot of these connected TVs already, and uh, Panasonic, for one, and I think others uh, will. Right now, there are some of their TVs, their Vieira Connect TVs, will support um, uh, putting. You know, they put a little. You buy a little device and put a camera basically on on your television, and you download the Skype app and uh, for your internet connected Panasonic TV, and you can do the FaceTime chatting basically as long as you get Grandma and Grandpa to. Go buy the gear. Well, too. you know, let me let me tell you an interesting story. So uh, I have an 11 year old son and uh, Xbox. I'm a gamer. He's a gamer. He's now a much better gamer than I am. Uh, so he's on Xbox Live playing games with other little 11, 12 year olds and, and pedophiles on the internet. Um, and uh, you know they're all blowing each other up. Um, they all, but they, they're, there's 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 like four or five and and uh, they all you know that that he hangs out with and they all play together and uh, they've only ever heard each other. So come Christmas. They all get connects, and the connect is the camera that cooks up the Xbox and like lets you do a motion and capture. And you're supposed to be able to you know, jump over rocks together over the internet. <laughs> well, they did that for about ten minutes, and then they all took the camera and looked at each other and they saw each other for the first time. And it was amazing that it's like you know the, the little 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 boy in Arizona picks it up. He's like, "Here's my dog. Here's what I look like. Here's my cat. Here's what it looks like out the window. This is my brother. I hate him." You know, and so that. The Kinect was supposed to be all about capturing stuff, but it actually turned into all these kids who'd never even seen who they were playing with before actually got to see each other. And it was actually really good because we could figure out which ones were actually 11 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so it's starting to happen. Uh, question over here. Uh, hi, Jim. Uh, congratulations. I probably watch more Revision 3 than I watch TNT or, or yes. the local carriers. Thank you. Uh, but my question was a little bit of uh, what goes missing when we cut the cord. And I'm an example. We've cut the cord. We, use, we don't have the Roku, but we have an Apple TV and, Net, and Netflix and the PlayStation with Hulu Plus and all that. And the, the question goes to discovery. It's like, how do, how do we discover what to watch? 
Um, it, it's interesting because we've replaced like what we used to watch in Turner, like the closer, they make such a bad job at being available in any of these platforms that we found very interesting alternatives. And now we fell in love with Dexter on, on Netflix. And, but, but it still remains, how do we discover new programming? It's the serendipity factor that you know, you used, a lot of newspapers used to say had when you were browsing around. Uh, how do you think social media plays into that, for example? Well, I think there, there are some check-in apps for TV that uh, we were all excited about six months ago, including uh, Philo, Get Miso, um, Get Glue. You know, and we put those on. I haven't seen those really explode yet. Um, to me, the best way to discover stuff is just through Facebook uh, and through your friends. And I, we're also seeing kind of the, I think we will see the rise of more kind of professional curators of video that whether they're on YouTube or on Roku or they're create, kind of the guys who are gonna, or, or, and gals who are going to create sort of curated sets of content. You'll find people that you like to find them. But, but there is so much stuff, and it's hard. It's hard to find stuff. And I would you know, turn it over to you guys, and you know, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, Google TV, that was their, that, that's the thing they're trying to do. Uh, unlike Roku, that's trying to be a video you know, kind of service box, um, Google, as you might expect, was trying to organize and, and create search and, and so forth across all of it. And uh, again, I think they, what they did is they took the internet paradigm of search, tried to make it work on TV, and, and it's just not working um, so far. And I don't count them out, but I think it's a huge problem that has you know, a lot of opportunity for somebody to solve. I don't think it's just going to be search. I mean, Facebook is probably as close as you could get where you start to see affinity groups, friends that recommend. but. I, I honestly don't know the answer, but it is a humongous problem. Just looking at what we're doing here, we're going to three or four different you know, apps, and within there, there's different categories, and one has search and one doesn't, and um, I think a lot of it still is word of mouth and what you hear from your friends, and so if you can make that work in, in this environment, I think there's an opportunity. Uh, yeah, did you want to follow up? Well, I mean, that's another problem is that, you know, when you're ESPN and you're getting $5 from every household in the U.S., it's pretty easy to go out and do a big campaign and, you know, wrap buses and put up billboards and things like that. I mean, you know, you guys, when you're not, uh, it, there's no money to do that. So, you know, that, that marketing aspect is tough. And that's why, you know, for us, um, we only go after a core demo. We try and do shows that are complimentary because that's one of the best ways to go out and do it. I mean, I wish I had your marketing budget, John. Part well, of your don't marketing don't budget. don't don't uh, exaggerate our marketing budget. <laughs> well, at least you have one. Yes, we do have one. <laughs> uh, is there? There's another question over here. Hey guys, uh, great presentations. Thanks. Uh, I'm curious about what you think about the impact of internet videos going to have on the broadband service providers. I just came from the OTT con out in California, and that was a big big topic of conversation out there. And Jim, for your business, are you all ad, uh, all, all, your, your business model is all ad based? And would you uh, strike a deal with a broadband service provider to optimize your content over their network? Curious about, yeah. about those things. Yeah, we, we are ad based. We uh, do pre-rolls and overlays and all that. But our unique model is sponsorship inside the video, where these hosts that have this direct connection with the audience actually talk about a product or service, introduce it, bring it in. Uh, and ones that make sense for that audience. But yeah, so I think that's a big problem where there's, you know, more and more video goes out, it's gonna start breaking some of these networks and we would, we would definitely do a deal with some. Someone wanna come up and say, let's do a deal to make it in really, really good looking HD. I got the good looking HD. Um, I got the content people want. I'm gonna be at Cox tomorrow. Maybe they'll ask me that. I don't think so, but, uh, but yeah, we would do that. It is, I've been hearing that, uh, well, first of all, there's a, there's a product I've seen in the, cable telco space where you can buy cash that sits inside of the operator's network so that you're, str you're, you're essentially doing Akamai's job, yeah. caching stuff inside your network to <laughs> offload the, essentially every single individual streaming the same you know, file from outside of your network. And most of the choke points I'm hearing now are not inside the network, but the pipe from the network to you know, the, the greater internet. Um, so I, I think... Uh, that's where the choke point is now, and I've seen, um, I've also heard that Akamai 
is really pushing hard to put their caching systems inside of these networks. And, and that's essentially, I mean, if you're paying Akamai, that's kind of what you're paying for. You, you right. are paying for an accelerated pipe that bypasses some of the bottlenecks. So I, that is happening a little bit, but it is, it's a big topic of discussion, and I think there's, there's a lot of room for innovation and, and, and change there. It's very controversial, too. I don't know if you've been hearing about the Level 3 Comcast dispute, but it's, uh, there, there's going to be some uh, public spats going, going on for a while here, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so one of the things I want to talk about, and, uh, any more questions? Uh, oh, there's one. Go ahead. The uh, revenue model in the cable industry has been pretty stable for a number of years. Some programmers pay to get on, some programmers are paid to put on, get on, and it's understood who gets to keep what ad revenue for, for what. But that seems to be a long way from settled in digital media. Uh, and, and that's a lot of what the argument between uh, you know, some, some delivery platforms and the major networks have been, for example, is who, who keeps how much of what ad revenue, who gets to place what ads, which way does revenue flow. How do you see that all shaking out, and how long is it going to take to shake out, and how is it going to affect consumers? I don't know, John. Let's start with you on that one, because you guys, you're, you're, you're living the existing model. How do you see it happening on the net? Well, we think uh, multi-platform is, is allowing both parties to see new value, right? Uh, that's where, that's where uh, we continue to strengthen the partnership. We go into a lot of conversations these days. Uh, it's no longer dominated about a linear network uh, relationship and a, and a deal that lasts five years and sub rates. It's all starting to be built around, you know, one of the first things they, they ask us about is our mobile, you know, our mobile success. Right. So they want to they want to tap into that. Uh, we see a lot of synergies in that regard. Um, obviously, all of them are talking about, you know, uh, slinging our service and our content onto iPads and other devices. So. So I think that's, that's the l new generation of this relationship where, you know, and TV authentication, TV everywhere authentication is another form of that as well. So, so we think that the, the relationship's going to strengthen, actually, as years go on, and, and there, there are a lot of different kind of spins to it. It's interesting. I mean, there's, you know, the Roku platform right now doesn't really have a direct support for any ad server, and although you can build it in, um, there's nothing really there, I and mean, they're selling boxes. You know, and there are different deals that, you know, we as a company have with a number of different people. I'm still waiting for the first check from Braxton, actually. Um, but uh, I thought you were paying me. No. <laughs> See, that's the thing. We haven't figured it out yet. Um, but no, Braxton, what do, you, what do you think on that line? I mean, how, how's that going to break out? Because you sit in the middle. I mean, yeah. you've got guys like us who are on your platform and happy to be there. Um, and then you're going out to the cable ops and putting stuff out there. And advertising is absolutely being served in there mm -hmm. somewhere. Right. Yeah, I think the... What's true is the, the notion of cable operators paying for programming, I think if you don't already have a deal, you're never going to get one. It's, you know, that's, that, that is over. Um, all new networks go either to video on demand or free, or in some cases actually pay the operator to be on them. So um, I think from now on, all new content offerings um, are going to be 100% ad supported. Um, I think because you're not getting a subscription fee, you may, you know, you're going to keep all your revenue. I think that's the difference, is that um, you're, you're essentially going to be doing all you can to be in, in front of these people and in front of the interface has been in, in return, you're going to be able to keep all that ad inventory that you get. What about Wealth TV? You were talking about that earlier. Yeah. What, what, yeah. What, are you, what do they fit in all this and what are they doing, you think? With their, their internet subscription? Yes. Well, I mean, I, there's a lot of talk about even ESPN, for instance, getting on some of these TVs and offering an a la carte service. And they have ESPN3, which, is, as you know, uh, you can get if you have an internet subscription from a major broadband provider. So I, I think Wealth TV is just one of the first examples of a, of a premium or, or a, you know, a cable network saying, hey, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to try to get subscription fees directly from the subscriber for that channel. The, 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 the feeling is they did it because they didn't have as much to lose because they only have, I think, five or five million existing subs, for instance. So yeah, well, look, they, Wealth TV tried to get on the big uh, cable operators, and they didn't. Right. Uh, and so they, you know, they, they wanted to reach a broader audience and so went out that way. Right. Three bucks a month. Um, people going to pay it? I don't know. We'll see. Um, I don't think so, but I applaud them for their courage. Um, we have a question over here. What about uh, your relationship with your CIOs and is uh, the use of virtual, virtual 
virtuality in cloud, is that a uh, possible relief for some bandwidth problems? I mean, I'll answer that because we are basically a cloud platform. We, we designed it before there was a cloud, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it was called, I guess, network computing or hosted SaaS or whatever it is. But uh, basically what we do is we host the, the large volumes of content in, in multiple data centers across the U.S. And then we just put a small device inside the capable operator system that's caching the, the stuff locally. So we, we started out as that kind of service. I do think that's where it's going, um, absolutely. And all these devices, I mean, iPad, the phones, every, everything are utilizing essentially the, the, a cloud type of system where you're spreading resources across a large, you know, swath of geography, data centers, resources, and so forth. But, you know, we still see a lot of viewers who are subscribing and downloading so that they can get a better experience because if it's downloaded, then you don't have to worry about buffering any of that. So, but I also believe that we're going to go, you know, that it will be all up in the cloud. John, want to add anything? Yep, I, I think it's inevitable. Yep. Question right there, yes. The mic's not on, maybe. Look for a button. Yeah. No? Yes. yes. Well, with all of the uniquely um, subscription services that are, are out there, how is um, the billing being handled for this, you know, and the security about putting out your your credit card information, I mean, is, it, is there some sort of consolidated billing model for, like, particularly for your, uh, your service, you've got several different subscriptions inside of there, how are you guys handling the billing for that? So it's a really good question on billing, and on, you know, on the Roku, you can subscribe to Netflix, you can subscribe to Hulu Plus, you can subscribe to um, the hidden porn channels, and they all have their own sort of billing mechanism. I mean, what do you think about that? There, That's a great there question. Hidden porn channels? Yeah. Um, news Just go me. search for Roku hidden channels, and there's that. You could actually have a YouTube channel on. The, the guy who's buying the Roku, um, seriously, if you're going to buy one, go search for it because there's a there's a YouTube channel that you don't get with this, but it's a hidden channel. You can go in and add it in. Uh, we do a lot with billing, so so I'll take a stab. Um, I, I do think it's all over the map. Uh, you know, that that's a perfect example where you can have three or four subscriptions. Roku recently requires you to give a credit card or a PayPal account in order to just get one, you know, registered. And so they're starting up their own kind of, you know, universal shopping cart capability. Um, so I think you're going to see all sorts of different options. Um, one of the advantages that some of our customers like cable and telcos are, are offering is that they have a consolidated bill. So you're already buying TV, data, phone, maybe some other things, and our system hooks right into the, that billing system. So um, you can start charging these different services on, on your cable or telco bill. And so I, I think we'll see lots of different models, but I do think people are going to be a little nervous about giving, you know, spewing their credit card or PayPal account to 60, 70 different places. And, and I think, you know, there's going to be a few trusted providers, you know, that, that you're willing to give it to. And after that, you know, you're not going to want to. I had an interesting conversation with a major CE manufacturer the other day, and, you know, global manufacturer, and, you know, these guys, uh, Samsung, LG, and this one, I, I think they're <laughs> providing the, you know, bill pay right there on the TV, right, where you're actually, and they're, they're mm -hmm. going to handle that, is what these guys yeah. claim. They're going to handle, they're, they're becoming a cable company in, in some respects. Yeah, uh, and that's, what, that's exactly what Roku's <laughs> doing. It's, yeah. They're forcing you to give that information, and they're obviously using it to upsell you services and try mm -hmm. to become that billing entity. That's but the nice. security you bring up is very important because, uh, you know, I haven't been impressed with the uh, software development capabilities of some of the TVs that we've worked with, and uh, which means that they may not have the secure capabilities that you really need. We, when I was at, at Ziff Davis, uh, I went back to PC Magazine, and right um, before I got there, uh, Elliot Spitzer came after Ziff Davis for, you know, taking credit cards for something and not doing a good job of it. And uh, it was a mess, and you can just imagine that on a much broader scale. So, uh, if it's a platform, it will, you know, it does have the potential to be hacked, and I'll bet those platforms will be hacked. We have time for one more question. If anybody has one, speak now, or I w I'm going to wrap up with a uh, question for our lovely panel. Um, I, I have a question, actually, but I don't want to. No, go ahead. You're the guy in front of you has a question, then I'm going to go to your question, then I'm going to wrap up. It's a is Oracle Sun uh, going to be a game changer? They're telling us they are. <laughs> is Oracle Sun going to be a game changer? I mean, look, they've already changed the game in many ways. 
Um, Larry Allison's tried to do interactive TV and TV stuff for a long time. I mean, what do you, do you guys see them or talk to them in a, I mean, they're right down the street from us. They never come talk to us. <laughs> I do an Oracle channel, by the way. If anybody out there knows anyone over there, now, tell them. This is, this is my second startup, and, and we started this three years ago, and, and we sell to, you know, enterprise, big, you know, cable programmer operators, and the first um, startup that we sold in 2005, more than half of our stuff was Sun and, and Oracle, actually, because uh, it had to be. It wasn't, the other stuff wasn't ready, and, and people wouldn't buy it. This company, 100% of what we do is Linux, Intel uh, servers, and so at least what we're seeing is um, that is, is, is now enterprise you know, quality and, and is being used by all of our biggest customers without hesitation. John, you had a question. Quick question to the two of you about Apple. So let's assume they do uh, put an Apple TV on the market in a year. What impact do you guys think that'll have on all of this stuff? I think it would be stupid to do an Apple TV. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, people don't buy new TVs that often. Um, and I just don't, I just, because, and the bill of materials is so high, I'm not sure that people will pay an extra 500 bucks for an Apple TV. Um, I don't yeah, know. I'm with you. I, I just, I mean, after the iPad, I was one of the people that said that's dumb, and now I've, I've bought like five of them, <laughs> <laughs> and a few other people have as well. Um, so I, I don't count them out, obviously, but I just, I can't see them doing it. I, I think what makes a lot more sense is what they're actually showing with the new iPad, which is HDMI out mm -hmm. on that device, and you, you use that as the navigation. It does full 1080p out. And it's beautiful, and you just hook that to your TV. I think that is what is makes TV sense. Play? Well, the, it'll be wireless HDMI soon. There's some right. really cool technology on the wireless yeah. HDMI once side. Once you can do that, I mean, once yeah. you don't have to plug a wire in and that thing will go to any HDMI-compatible TV, then I, then I think that's a really interesting TV so, device. So the iPad's not a fad? <laughs> How many people think the iPad's a fad and we're all going to give our tablets up? Um, how many people are buying a Motorola Zoom next week? Our iPad 2. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, so, so I have one last question for you guys, just to, to wrap it up. What is, you know, there are all these connected devices, and we're talking about iPads and Apple TVs, and um, you know, what is the, what's the home of the future look like in five years? Who's going to be providing the content? Who's going to be providing the pipe? And how are we going to get it all working around the house? John, you want to start? Yes, I'm obligated uh, to answer that Comcast, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. They did buy NBC, didn't they? Um, so you think, but seriously, you think Comcast is going to figure it out and, and really help TV everywhere across all these devices? I think they'll be a force to be reckoned with, and that's not yeah. a very profound statement. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean, they've done, with the iPad app, they, they've got a million downloads in the first, like, two weeks of coming out with it. They started out and it was kind of lame. Well, it was fun to change the channels on you know, the I remote know controls, think. but you couldn't stream anything to it. But a month later, you could stream the full lineup of all your shows to that, that device. And I, I've noticed a change in my behavior where I was using Hulu Plus and I was using Netflix, and now I'm actually going to the Xfinity app mm -hmm. first, oftentimes, to find it. So I think the challenge is they are the biggest, and they've spent a ton of money to get these things up and running, and they still have a long way to go to really be ubiquitous. So. I think the challenge is going to be the next, you know, the, 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 even the next size down, like AT&T, Verizon, and, and the next tier are going to have a hard time doing that. And anybody below that, you, you cannot justify the R&D to build all that yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, our bet is that we're, we're going to provide a lot of that infrastructure as turnkey capability. So I do think you'll see some vendors like us um, essentially take, you know, you've got, you've got a big pipe. You've got a great relationship with the programmers, and you know you, you have a relationship with a lot of subscribers. If you can layer on that functionality and and that you know some of those great features with all supporting all these devices, I think they have a play. But but I think there's going to be a lot of shifts in these next couple of years um, as all that happens. The, the the most interesting thing that could happen is there's a lot of rumors that. Comcast will start offering over-the-top services in other markets. So even if you're not in a Comcast market, you can get Xfinity and you can get, you know, maybe not the full lineup, but you'll probably be able to get ESPN and the major linear channels and all that. And I think once that happens, it's going to start a war between, you know, all the major brands of, of uh, 
service providers. And that, that's going to get really interesting. Uh, and then the last thing I'll add is that uh, when YouTube adds in um, their eight games of NFL, uh, then it's really going to be interesting because you'll be able to use YouTube to watch some of this stuff as well. So um, with that, I want to thank uh, John and Braxton. Very interesting. All you guys for your questions. And, uh, Anne and everybody for setting this up. You know, to the guys who put this all together, it was awesome. And uh, the MIT forum. Thanks.